All this talk lately about never forget made me realize just how much I have forgotten. No, not about 9-11, but so many things surrounding my last mission trip. I wrote about it in last week's bulletin. Before the mission trip ever even took place, I went home to, to my parents' home in Chillicothe, Ohio, where they had lost, because of a big storm, a number of trees. So I took a couple of the seminarians with me, and we spent the day chopping down trees and cutting them up into logs. Well, when I left, I didn't realize it, but I had forgotten my shoes at my parents' house and still haven't gotten them back. Then, for the mission trip itself, I managed to not only forget the house keys to the church here in Milwaukee, but didn't realize it until I got to Grand Forks, North Dakota, in the middle of a great thunderstorm, the lightning was very close that day, I remember too, that I had forgotten the chapel keys to their mission. Then, once I found that, and the next morning was about to leave, somehow I managed to drop my car keys into the trunk of my car, shutting the trunk, of course, but thankfully the rest of the car was was open. Upon returning to St. Gertrude, I completely forgot I had scheduled, well in advance, to meet with an engaged couple to prepare them for marriage. I even managed to lose my glasses for a couple of days this past week, too. So it's been a rough couple of weeks. Never forget turned into my coat of arms, oblitusum, I have forgotten. But forgetting really is the key to heaven when you stop and think. I'm thinking of St. Adelaide. Probably most of you have not heard much about her. She was a 10th century saint. It is said of her that she never remembered an injury nor forgot any kindness. She was a, the daughter of a certain King Rudolf II of Burgundy. And when Adelaide was two years old, her father betrothed her to another little child, Lothair. Back in those days, there were always the arranged marriages, especially among royalty families. And this was, this engagement was part of a peace settlement between King Rudolf and Hugh over who had ruled Italy. That's why they did that. But later on, when they were old enough, Lothair and St. Adelaide actually did get married. They had a daughter. But here's where the story really begins. Soon after, one of the, a man named Ivrea, he was a rival claimant, claimant to the throne, had, had St. Adelaide's husband murdered in cold blood. He then tried to marry her to his son, his own son, and because Adelaide refused, she was then taken by Ivrea and locked up in a castle in the middle of a lake where there was no way out, no way to escape. She was there mistreated even further by Ivrea's wife who lived there. But eventually, Providence would send a priest who would help her to escape. So she made her way to safety, where she then took the time to sit down and write a letter to the king of Germany. Otto, I think, was his name, asking for help. And she promised that for this help, in gratitude for this help, I will then agree to marry you. That's the way things worked back in those days. It's always a little odd to our ears, but it is the way they worked. But when the king... So they did end up marrying, but when that king died, all the problems started once more. She had a, a son, Otto II. He received the crown. Then, because Adelaide had such a poor relationship with her daughter-in-law, Otto II's wife, Otto sent her out of the castle, kicked her out, his own mother, 
kicked her right out of the castle. Imagine the hard feelings that naturally arise for a family to do that, especially to one's own mother. That would be a fight that would probably never end, feelings that could never be fixed. But yet, remember, Adelaide never remembered an injury, not even an injury that was done by her own flesh and blood, her own son, who was so ungrateful. When her son came back, and he did come back on his knees to beg his mother's forgiveness, she was so quick and ready to grant it. And again later, she was sent away from the castle by her grandson, Otto III, but again, she never remembered and was quick to forget. I think the same can be said of Our Lady of Sorrows, sort of a noto bene to our sermon today. One saint says that, behold, Our Lady has given us, given the world, her own son. And as they take him down off the cross, all mangled and bloody and scarred, his flesh not only pierced but torn from his very bones. As Our Lady holds him there, the saint seems to say, and behold how the world has given him back. Yet Mary, our sorrowful virgin mother, never remembers, much like Adelaide, the offense that we have committed against her son, that we have committed against her by putting to death her divine Son by our sins. She never remembered that. But she always remembered to pray for you, to be the greatest benefactress that you will ever have. And she only asks one thing. She appeared to St. Bridget once, and she, she complained how people were forgetting. People no longer remembered her bitter sorrows. And she said, Bridget, never forget. Always remember to contemplate my sufferings in the passion of, our, of my son. And in this way, many sins will be given, will be forgiven you. Now, in the Roman breviary, today, as I said, we read the antiphon of the Magnificat. And it's also used as part of the priest's preparation for Mass, also some formal uh, prayers of preparation before each Mass. The priest begins it by begging God for one thing, to forget. Remember not, O Lord, our iniquities, nor those of our parents, neither take thou vengeance on our sins. We, or rather the just man, that is a holy man, Saint, the sacred scripture tells us, sins seven times a day. What about one who is not just? 14, 21, 121 sins a day? some of them mortal, by which we turn our backs on the very ones, the very one who created us from nothing, and who has loved us from all eternity and wishes only for our eternal happiness. We sin so often and offend God so coldly, that God who burns with love of us, it is these, these are terrible sins. The sins that you can think of that you committed last week and the week before that we so confidently ask Almighty God to forget. And with a little sorrow on our part and the confession of our sins, 
he will indeed be quick, like St. Adelaide, to not only forgive, but to forget your sins. So, if you forget, sometimes your, your morning prayers, sometimes, or, or even that it's Friday and you accidentally eat meat, or you're sleepy and already in bed when you remember you didn't finish today's rosary, but at the same time you never remember the hurts and the resentments of the day, nor even any of the temptations that came to you, and most of all, you forgot yourself and your wants and your needs, it may be that this, what we call the mutual forgetfulness pact, may actually be what gets you into heaven. There's a wonderful story, I love it very much, of a fat Franciscan, a fat and jolly Franciscan. He was always late for prayers in the community life, but always first for his meals. He paced himself at work and at chore time, but he would wolf down his dinners. And then, of course, seconds too, if he could get them. Yet, when he found himself on his deathbed, about to breathe his last and to meet his God, he was seemingly quite at peace. And his superior questioned this. And so the monk, the fat Franciscan, he admitted to everything that he had failed to do. He admitted most humbly. But then he told the superior that he never held a grudge and he never resented it when he was mocked by others nor did he remember all those times when he was judged unkindly by his fellow brothers in the Franciscan order. His final words were something like, God will never remember my sins, for I have never remembered the sins of others against me. What a lesson. If only we, at the moment of our death, can say the same, that we have forgotten, and that we remember, however, the kindnesses of others, and especially those of the sorrowful virgin, then how peaceful a death you will have. Remember not, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost.